Oh, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. I can feel my faculties leaving me. Uh, my ability to exercise logic and reasoning is unimpeded, but my memory is shot. I can have a very profound train of thought, but unless I get it out or write it down immediately, it's often gone. My ability to focus and concentrate is increasingly compromised. The trajectory of my health has paralleled my assessment of the fate of human civilization and the living planet. It has been surrounded by denial. It's just a few years since I went to the medical profession to a doctor with symptoms that were a milder version of what I experience now. It's not so long ago that I was told that I was depressed or suffered from sleep apnea or obesity. If I had smoked, I would have been told that was it. A couple of years ago, I was referred to the neurology department of the hospital and in all of that time, there's been no diagnosis, more just more tests and assessment. If it weren't so serious, for me at least, it would be uproariously funny. I can imagine that at some stage, the panic button might be pushed and a radical solution looked for, just as it has been with the climate. And I can imagine in my eyes, mind's eye, my partner delivering a Greta Thunberg type address to the medicos. How dare you? Why didn't you do something? Meanwhile, I know, and my partner, who lives with me 27, 24 seven, knows, we both know that my health is declining. So I feel a sense of urgency. It's important for me to try and get my thoughts together as best I can and draw together the threads of all that I've been doing for the last eight years of my blog. Indeed, to reassess the assumptions built up over a lifetime. I've been aware of climate change for over 30 years now. It used to be called, back then, the greenhouse effect. And then at some stage it was renamed global warming. I personally don't like the term climate change because it hides the severity of what's happening. And I would prefer to talk about global warming giving rise to catastrophic climate change. Or even better in my mind would be to use the term climate collapse. Earlier on, I followed what others were saying about the subject. And even back then, I was hotter on describing the situation than I was about solutions, but always held to the hopeful belief that our political leaders would get together to solve the problem. This forlorn hope was largely removed when I joined friends to watch the Danish cops pursue the environmental activists and treat them as if they were the enemy at COP15 in Copenhagen. That was the meeting in which world leaders agreed on one thing, and that was to do nothing. And I have a, a recollection of our Minister of Treaty Negotiations at the time, whatever he called himself, roundly criticising the leaders of Pacific nations for departing from the do-nothing consensus by telling the world how bad the situation really was. So that was back in 2009 and in the shadow of the 2008 financial collapse. Disillusioned, I turned my attention to other things such as peak oil and my current period of activism started in 2010 when I first encountered Michael Rupert who had a huge influence on me uh, and talked about economic collapse. I remember his words that I responded to that the economy was a Ponzi scheme. And I started my blog up, uh, up my blog early in 2011 and I was brought back to talking 
about abrupt climate change. Um, when I first heard uh, Guy McPherson, so people tend to have had that sort of effect on me. I hear just a few sentences and it resonates and it all develops from there. So Guy's, Guy McPherson's words had an immediate effect on me. I had stumbled upon the now suppressed, largely suppressed BBC documentary on global dimming a couple of years before. So I was ripe for hearing about positive reinforcing feedbacks in the methane clathrate gun. It made perfect sense to me that the planet was warming far more quickly than could ever have been imagined. It made sense that the changes would be far quicker than the ability for nature to adapt or humans or animals to adapt and we would be left unable to produce grains at the scale necessary to main civilization. So really what that implied was uh, or is either civilizational collapse or near-term human extinction. And there's a sting to all of this in the aerosol masking effect or global dimming. So if we stop polluting, uh, perhaps through a major sudden decrease in uh, industrial activity, or if we decided suddenly to uh, stop uh, injecting aerosols into the atmosphere, uh, then the particulates that help mask a lot of this warming would fall out of the sky and give rise to a sudden but undetermined increase in global temperatures, which could then lead to the release of a 50 gigaton burst of methane, an extremely potent greenhouse gas released from clathrates. The icy frame that protects the methane keeps it in place. That in addition to the fall off in albedo from rapidly melting ice in the Arctic. All of these are processes which feed off each other and amplify the previous warming. And I'm not even going to mention uh, the huge number of positive feedbacks uh, that were um, chronicled by, by, by Guy in, in recent years. So um, I'm just going to touch on this, but much of the difficulty I have is with binary or dualistic thinking. According to this, only one thing can be true at any one time. You can't have anything other than a single cause. So one example is from my recent history with the near-term human extinction crowd. Last year, for the first time, thanks to developing a cooperative relationship with Margot, I developed some skills in reading the different data sets coming out of the Arctic, such as NASA Worldview. And this led me to see that a lot of what we have been told is simply just not the case and that the state of the Arctic ice is a lot worse than what we're being led to believe. Mostly by only talking about sea ice extent, which could be anything from a slushy puddle up to two year old ice, instead of talking about uh, ice volume or ice thickness. The NTHE crowd were waiting for a Blue Sea event, and he even had it down as a fait accompli. And when it did not transpire, that was back in July, and then when it did not transpire in the way that they thought it would in August, uh, they did a flip-flop from despair to celebration, because we have another year! In fact, at the end of the melt season, the ice was in a terrible state. Marco and I observed methane, large amounts of methane, coming up from under the ice in eastern Siberia. And that's a phenomenon that's since been confirmed uh, in a recent scientific paper by Natalia Shokhova and others. So all of this 
is on the basis of a theoretical construct which no longer, no matter how likely it is to be true, and I believe it, it to be true, that's the way, that's where the evidence is, uh, is headed, it's still a theoretical construct. And I just have to think back to the 70s when scientific consensus was that we were heading into an era of global cooling, which was, of course, incorrect. I believe that we will only really learn the truth by looking in the rear vision mirror and by then we will most likely be on our way out. So getting back to Margot and I, nobody liked our independence and they either ignored our findings um, or they ascribed the discoveries uh, to others. So um, I'm just going to touch on this, but much of the difficulty I have is with binary or dualistic thinking. According to this, only one thing can be true at any one time. You can't have anything other than a single cause. So one example is from my recent history with the near-term human extinction crowd. Last year, for the first time, thanks to developing a cooperative relationship with Margot, I developed some skills in reading the different data sets coming out of the Arctic, such as NASA Worldview. And this led me to see that a lot of what we have been told is simply just not the case, and that the state of the Arctic ice is a lot worse than what we're being led to believe, mostly by only talking about sea ice extent, which could be anything from a slushy puddle up to two-year-old ice, instead of talking about uh, ice volume or ice thickness. The NTHE crowd were waiting for a Blue Sea event, and he even had it down as a fait accompli. And when it did not transpire, that was back in July, and then when it did not transpire in the way that they thought it would in August, uh, they did a flip-flop from despair to celebration, because we have another year! In fact, at the end of the melt season, the ice was in a terrible state. Marco and I observed methane large amounts of methane coming up from under the ice in eastern Siberia. And that's a phenomenon that has since been confirmed uh, in a recent scientific paper by Natalia Shokhova and others. So all of this is on the basis of a theoretical construct, which no longer no matter how likely it is to be true, and I believe it, it to be true, that's the way, that's where the evidence is, uh, is headed, it's still a theoretical construct. And I just have to think back to the 70s when scientific consensus was that we were heading into an era of global cooling, which was of course incorrect. I believe that we will only really learn the truth by looking in the rear vision mirror and by then we will most likely be on our way out. So getting back to Margot and I, nobody liked our independence and they either ignored our findings um, or they ascribed the discoveries uh, to others. While looking at the satellite pictures, we notice so many anomalies in the skies above the Arctic. And similarly, I was seeing clouds above us that I had never seen before in my previous 60 plus years on this planet. 
I posted photographs and invited people to provide rational explanations uh, that were never forthcoming. The one thing that did make sense, um, having had no uh, response to my request, was geoengineering. Um, especially when I learned that what I had been told, that Dane Wickington at least, was not denying anthropogenic climate change at all, although others are, that's the problem. But he was showing how a program of spraying the sky with nanoparticulates, aluminum and strontium, etc., was actually designed to hide and suppress the extent of warming and climate collapse coming from human-caused global warming, i.e. from greenhouse gases. Once I started talking about that, it was only a short matter of time before I was kicked out of the NTHE community of doomers for wandering onto ideas that were likened to flat earth or creationist theories, neither of which I've ever entertained or expressed. So if you don't like the conclusion, then it doesn't matter how much evidence you put up. There's always going to be no evidence. And when I was an acupuncturist, uh, it didn't matter how much evidence was put up for, um, for the efficacy of acupuncture. Uh, the same old people just went on saying there's no evidence. It also points to the idea that only one thing Always one's pet ideas or theories can be true at one time. However, reality is complex and multifaceted, much more of what my friend Margot calls a combination plate. So I'm just talking about the latest examples of where I've had to re-examine my assumptions of many years. And isn't it a strength to uh, adapt one's views to, to uh, changing evidence rather than uh, just continuing on with what you believe 20 years ago and fit reality into your thinking. So I'll be saying much more about the geoengineering thing in the next few days, God willing. In the meantime, I think I probably said enough. Time's up. These are some of my reflections and my thoughts. I'm not trying to tell anybody else what they should be thinking. I'm just trying to sort out my own thinking and to share something that may or may not be useful for those that choose to listen to what I have to say. It's your decision. This is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under.